It's my pleasure to welcome Cairo Time director Ruba Nada to the Ischia Global Film and Music Festival. Thanks for joining us, Ruba. Thank you. And we're here to talk about Cairo Time, but before we do, let's start, Ruba, with your breaking in story. How you got into the industry and made so many films that are sadly still unavailable in the West. <laughs> the, uh, the many lives you lived before Cairo Time, if you will. Um, well, I was a short story writer since I was 14. I started writing short stories and um, just madly kept writing them and getting them, trying to get them published. And university, I studied literature. And then my final year, I just decided to, to I wanted to be a filmmaker. I, I saw my stories in my head. They're very visual. And I thought that I could, I had something to say. And so I went to NYU and I studied film for six weeks. I came back to Toronto and I started making these very gritty short films that were so passionate. Um, and they were like little stories and they were based on my short stories. And I started sending them out to film festivals in Europe first. And they just hit big. They, they were very welcomed and very supported. And before I knew it, you know, like my first my second short film that was called Do Nothing, which was a four minute film starring my sister, my 11 year old sister, had gone to over 400 film festivals internationally. And so I just kept building up until I'm here. Were these shoestring in terms of budget? Absolutely, I was working nine to five in this office job um, and taking every single penny I was making and putting them into my films. I, I signed up to, for, to this co-op where if, I, if you volunteer, you have access uh, cheap to, for, to film equipment because I've only shot on film, on film cameras and film stock. And I trained my sisters and my very good friends to be my crew. And so I, I was like a jack of all trades. I was like operating the camera, I was focusing, I was directing, I was catering, I was cooking for my crew. I miss those days sometimes. Well, it's funny, you talked about short stories, and I can kind of see Cairo time as a short story. Uh, what was the inspiration behind the brilliant and beguiling Cairo time? Oh, you're sweetheart. Um, I was obsessed with making Cairo time. I'd, I'd had this uh, idea, this image in my head, ever since I was 16 years old and I, my parents had taken me on a visit to Cairo and my mother who's Palestinian is blonde and green eyed and I remember she walked up ahead of us and all these men you know were, t were, were cat calling her and so I, I'd had that image and I'd locked it away for years and then more recently I wanted to tell a story just about that was about real love that was very romantic that I felt that in the West it had become all about immediate gratification um, and so I wanted to do something that was very about two people that it was very unexpected between the two of them and so I, I, I just put all of these images that I'd buried for years together and out came Cairo time. On the surface what we have is a very simple albeit very graceful and very elegant love story Below the surface, what are your intentions with this film? What is it that you want the audience to come away with after this experience? Oh, I love your questions. Um, what I want the audience to come away with is I, I want people to start talking about love again. I feel like in the West, and I was born in Canada, but I feel like in the West we've become, we've forgotten how to live, you know, what life is. We've forgotten family. We, we, we're kind of like in this mode of go, go, go. Um, whereas in the Middle East, it's kind of like, it's, yeah, it's, you know, it's very laid back and, you know, it, there's, 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 there's no obsessive hurry, anxiety towards checking your Blackberry all the time and making sure you get back to people in 30 seconds. And so before you know it, your life is done. And, and, I, so, and so the bigger statement was that. It was about a woman who'd, you know, had spent a lifetime waiting to take that vacation with her husband. And, you know, she's waited most of her life. And so it's, and it's Cairo chipping away at her guard. What do you find most intriguing about the arc of these characters, where they begin and where they end up? Well, because I'm a short story writer, I don't, I kind of, 
I'm rebellious with, um, you know, having like a beginning, middle, and end, and I'm I'm rebellious again. I mean, I, I love story. I really focus on story. The thing about arcs and characters and themes and all that stuff, plot, is that it's become very Hollywoodized, and audiences can feel that. Like they feel like the characters aren't authentic, and so the arc for Juliet, for example, you you can't like I can't even pinpoint it. When I'm watching the movie, I can't pinpoint when they start to fall in love. And so by the end, I mean, I don't want to give it away, but by that last scene, your, your, your heart's broken with Juliet because you, you actually don't know when it happened. And, and so because you don't know when and you haven't seen it, it, hit, it takes you off guard, which is exactly what I wanted the feeling to be. I wanted it to be like a punch in the stomach for an audience. Well, you set me up beautifully for my <laughs> next question. Which is, how can a film like Cairo Time be made in an American market that is currently only interested in the next Apatow comedy or things that go boom? This is easy because I, I know that audiences at the end of the day want a story that's told with a, point, a strong point of view and that's told from a passionate place. The thing about Cairo Time is that it's, it's very universal. Like we've all been there. We've all you know, been in love with someone that we can't exactly be with or we can't have. It's a very universal story, Romeo and Juliet. Um, I, 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 I'm interested, I'm the kind of filmmaker, I'm inter I've made my short films that are very gritty and they're made with $500. I've made those films. Now I'm interested in making films that I'm crazy, still crazy about, but that can reach an audience. Because, you know, when it's not my money that I'm putting into a film, I'm sort of like, you know, you have to, you have to be respectful of that. So I actually believe that I can make something that's very un-Hollywood with Cairo Time, um, but have it succeed. Alexander Siddig was telling me earlier how there's no place for an actor in a big budget spectacle like Clash of the Titans. Your film, by sharp contrast, is a love letter to the actor and it lives or dies by what they bring to it. So talk us through the varying approaches that you use to coax the best out of an actor. Well, I actually wrote the role for Alexander. I've been a huge fan of his for years and I, as a director, I think my, the first thing I do is I make it extremely comfortable for them and I make it so that they trust me. And so the environment is a place where they just feel at completely at, at calm and at ease. I've, I've written this, the story, I've written those characters, I know those characters inside out, but I allow, like, they, it's their turn now. You know, it's their turn to become that character and I love you know, with both Patricia and Ale and Alexander, it, like they're able to take the, my words and that character and, and make it real, and play around. And that's, I think the, the the best performances always happen when when you let your actor, when you trust your actors, and you let them play around. 